I should welcome someone pretty special uh, today, and that is Brett, our cartoonist. He will be adding a bit of flavour to the presentation uh, as we go through today uh, as well. Today is, a, is an opportunity for us to get in and, uh, and explain uh, a lot about what's going on, because it, it's, it, we're living in unprecedented times. The, the changes which we have seen over the last few months uh, have been you know, huge. And so today we wanted to spend some time trying to demystify some of that and explain why it's going on and really you know, allow you to ask questions and answers uh, at the end uh, as well. Um, before we get started though, uh, one, uh, one thing which we do need to do, and as you can see, uh, the disclaimer that is up there on the, uh, on the board there, um, or in real fact, it's, uh, it's talking really about this is general in nature, um, etc. So, but let's get into, uh, into the actual presentation uh, itself. So today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it in, in three sections, if you like. First up, we're going to talk about it from the regulator's perspective, the regulator challenge. And then we'll get into the lender challenge, which Brett will come and uh, talk about. And then Steve will talk about it from the broker's perspective uh, as well, and how this change also creates opportunity in the market. But um, as we do that, let's, let's start by taking a step back. And really, one of the key things that, uh, that you'll pick up as we go through today is that we, there are really three changes which are going on, gone in the market over the last few months. And we often bring that together and say, oh, that's just the, uh, the investor cap changes. But in actual fact, there are three significant changes that have happened. And what we're seeing at the moment is that we're seeing the three regulators, the Reserve Bank, APRA, and ASIC, working together very closely. Now, the RBA has a, a philosophy, or a, a job, really, which is all about the stability of the economy. APRA, it's all about making sure that we're protecting deposit holders and we have a safe, stable, and secure banking environment. And ASIC is more the watchdog and looking after the consumer. But what we're seeing right now is, is that those regulators are working very, very closely together around the changes that we have going on in the marketplace. And I'll spend a bit more time talking about that in a minute. But as I said, there are three changes. The first of those uh, is the investor cap, uh, which is there. And this is probably the one that's got the most press. And that's our uh, investor cap talks about the fact that your investment lending book as a bank, as an ADI, can't grow more than 10% year on year. So if our investor book is 100 at the beginning of the year, it can't be more than 110 at the end of the year. Brett will go into that in a bit more detail as we get into it. The second change which has occurred is changes in capital requirements for the major banks, the big four, and Macquarie. And essentially that has meant that the, the five banks we talk about there have to hold more capital against their mortgages. And so to hold that, more, that, that increased capital, and you would have seen a number of the banks raise capital. In our case, over five and a half billion dollars worth of capital was raised uh, a few weeks ago. We've seen CBA raise five. We've seen Westpac and ANZ also raise capital over the last few months. Uh, and that capital has done you know, one thing for the shareholder. The shareholder has actually had their holding diluted. So in, with the regulators coming out and asking us to hold more capital, we've actually had to go back to the shareholder and say, we're going to have to dilute your shareholding as part of this to raise the capital. As a result, you'll have also seen changes in price that have occurred during that period as well. Not just against front book, but also against back book, because the capital which the regulator has asked for is against the total book uh, that is out there. And Brett will explain uh, that in a bit more detail uh, as well. And the third of those uh, changes is around the responsible lending. Um, and this has come out in, in something called APG223. APG223 is actually guidelines, essentially, on how to run a bank that we have been given uh, by the regulator. It's almost like good practice guidelines for us to follow uh, in the way that we manage and assess risk, and assess credit uh, inside a bank. And so that's been a you know, key thing to talk about, that there are actually three changes that have, that have been going on, not just the one. But the real big question that we have is why? Why have there been these changes? So what we need to do is just take a, a little bit of a step back and have a look at where the, where the economy is at the moment. And if we look at that, that uh, graph there in the capital expenditure in the market, really what that is showing uh, and that red line is the mining uh, component and the black line is the non-mining uh, component. What that is showing is that the mining boom, or at least the construction, et cetera, that needed to go with the mining boom is over. And out the back of it, in the non-mining sector, we haven't seen that capital expenditure kick in either. 
And so as a result, we're seeing a general slowing in the economy that's going on. And off the back of that, we've also seen an increase in the unemployment level across the country. So it's gone from about 5.1 to 6.1. So it's up 100 basis points, 1%. Or at least that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is unemployment is up 20% on where it was, going from 5 to 6. And whilst that's still historically you know, relatively low and, and nothing to be too alarmed about, it is still quite a change in the level of unemployment uh, in the Australian economy as well. So what's going on? What have the regulators, what's government tried to do to, uh, to change that? Well, we all know this. We all know the simple answer to this. The RBA has stepped in and has been moving cash rates down. If we look there, since the 1st of February, they were at four and a quarter, uh, we're now down at 2%. Now obviously we're reducing cash rates to try and drive growth in the economy, particularly to try and get that non-mining sector capital expenditure up. And it's been effective in one particular area, and that is residential property. Particularly, as you know, living in New South Wales, living in Sydney, in Sydney, and also uh, in Melbourne uh, as well, it's there. Maybe not so successful uh, in some of the other capital cities, but it's really driven some strong growth in Sydney and Melbourne uh, markets that's there but it hasn't given the growth in the non-mining the non capital expenditure component. And so now we're sort of stuck in a situation where really they want to continue to drive growth in the Australian economy. But if we continue to push down cash rates, then what's actually going to happen to house prices, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne? Are they going to continue at those rates? And the regulators are worried about that if they were to continue at those rates, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. So what, the, what have they done? Well, the regulators have stepped back, worked together and sort of said, well, one other way for us to manage this is to put a cap on the level of investment lending available to the banks, through the banks, at 10%. And so that has, uh, that has come out uh, as, as one of the ways that they're doing that. We often term them macro prudential measures, et cetera, but essentially that, that is what uh, they're talking about uh, with that investor cap that's there and the why that it's there. Now, the regulator has a couple of choices to make in the way that they, uh, they give us rules in the, in the market as well. They can either be very prescriptive, and let's go to New Zealand for a minute to be very prescriptive. And, and many of you would have heard about the 80% cap on LVRs in New Zealand. But actually in Auckland, they've gone one step further. And now there's a cap on, uh, in Auckland of 70% from an LVR perspective. Now you think about that for a second. What happens when you've got a maximum LVR of 70% in a particular city like that? Well, it's having some unintended consequences in the marketplace. How does a first home buyer get into the market? 30% deposit in the fastest growing city in New Zealand. It's pretty hard. It's also the spot where most, most employment is growing as well uh, in New Zealand is in Auckland. And so that's a quite a prescriptive rule uh, that they've placed, that the regulators placed on it in New Zealand. In Australia, we've done something slightly different. So the regulators have set broad rules, like get under a 10% cap. And then they've allowed the institutions to work out how they're going to do that. And, now, and that's really what you're seeing playing out. So different institutions starting at different places and having to get to that 10%, you're seeing lots of uh, differences in the way that's, that's playing out in the market, but still with that one broad rule that they have to meet. Now, the second component at, uh, of change I already mentioned there um, was capital requirements. Now, this slide uh, really worries a lot of people because it goes back to the US housing pricing index and you look at that and you go, that's a GFC. We're not suggesting anything like the GFC here. But what we do want to point out is that you might remember back during the, G the GFC, do you remember in, um, Freddie Mac? Remember some of those names in the US? Remember what happened to the US economy when those, those institutions couldn't survive a downturn in the marketplace? And so the capital requirements that have been put in place are to try and make sure that we have a safe and stable and secure banking system right through a cycle. Because inevitably rates will rise, and they will rise back to long-term averages that are out in the marketplace. And when they do, the regulators want to make sure that we have a safe and secure banking environment that can withstand any of those changes. They don't want us to get into a situation uh, like uh, you know, they've had in the US post-GFC. And really what you see here is that extra capital is just to deal with any unforeseen loss that may be there and to make sure that the banks can handle that themselves. Make sure that they don't need to step in and handle it for us. And the third change, as I mentioned before, 
was all about responsible lending. Now, this particular graph is showing the growth in interest-only lending from December 2009 through to March of this year. From December 2009 to March, it's gone from 30% to 42% of all lending that's occurring in the Australian marketplace. And the regulator has some concerns about this. You no doubt did read some articles uh, around uh, what was going on here, and that the regulators are concerned about this massive growth in, in interest-only uh, lending that's going on. And so what, what have they done to try and, 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 wor and you know, help curb some of that from a responsible lending perspective? Well, I've looked at a number of, of, of things that have gone on. First of all, um, they've changed the serviceability buffer on lending, so to at least 2% above the loan product rate, and a floor lending of at least 7. So if someone's at, uh, say, 4.5%, and say we add the 2% it gets to 65 no, it'll be done at least at the floor of 7 that's there. And the way the regulations talk as well, they don't just talk about it being a floor of 7, they say a reasonable margin above 7. So in our case, for example, it's 7.4%. They've also ensuring that we look at all debt from a serviceability perspective, uh, not just the debt in question when you're doing an assessment process. And obviously that makes it harder in some, some situations to get all that information together and make sure that you're assessing it in the right way against all the debt that's there. But obviously that's important if you're trying to assess uh, whether they're going to be able to pay this and pay this through any particular cycle uh, that goes through the economy. Tightening income assessments as well, whether that be uh, rental income and the shading of rental income but also dividends and bonuses and so on as well that are there. And finally, a buffer ab above the household expenditure measure, or HEM. And we all know that if you've got someone who's got, say, you know, five kids going to a private school, the average expenditure that that person is going to have is going to be considerably higher than a single person. But at the moment, there's this measure that has sat there as the household expenditure measure, which has also been used as a baseline. And so really what they're trying to, to ensure that us as, as uh, lending institutions are doing is making sure that we're taking into account the real expenditure that people have. And so there's been a number of changes that have gone through and you've seen lots and lots of lenders reply and, and uh, do different things in different ways uh, around some of this and have to come out and make different changes. They all started at different places uh, as well, around all three of the changes. But it's important also to remember what the government and regulators could have or still could do if they don't get some of the responses and, and the slowing in the market that they would like. So there's a number of other measures that they could look to, from either removing negative gearing or increasing deposit requirements for investment lenders, adjusting ga capital gains tax, the foreign buyer policy, some of you will have seen. Uh, in fact, there was a, an open letter from Joe Hockey in the uh, Daily Telegraph a couple of days ago uh, around uh, this, very, this very item as well and what they were doing and some, uh, some policy introduced into uh, Parliament uh, just uh, at the end of last week as well. They could have been forced postcode and geographic restrictions like New Zealand. Um, or you could have a loan to income restriction, for example. So you might have to have a uh, six times serviceability there, you've got your income, your loan can't be more than six times your income, I'll get that right. Um, and, and another of other uh, items which, uh, which could have gone, gone on there. And so there's, there's other items that they absolutely could look to do there. But from a regulator's perspective, They've had to step back and say, why? Why are we doing this? And it's because of their, they're worried about changes in the economy and they want to make sure we've got a strong financial system and a sustainable economy. So they've increased the, risk, the uh, regulation on investment lending. There's been an increase in capital requirements um, and they've done that in probably a limited prescriptive way so that the institutions have to uh, work out how to apply that and so you're seeing quite considerable change because of the, uh, the changes that have been implemented. And that's something that all the lenders are having to battle with. And I'd like to invite Brett up to talk about that battle and how, as a lender, uh, we're beginning to deal with that. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's uh, fantastic to, to see you all here. Uh, so just to put that together, Anthony really sort of covered what is happening in the real economy, how does that translate into housing prices, and then what does that mean for the regulator in some of the changes that they've implemented? So what I'm going to do is put that together in terms of, as a lender, what does that mean? And yep, I work for, for NAB and I'll be talking on behalf of Advantage and NAB Broker, but I think everything that I'll be covering will be 100% applicable to every lender within the Australian market at the moment. So firstly, investor cap, and I'll be covering three things, investor cap, capital requirements, and responsible lending, as Anthony did. So the first one is to have a look at Investor lending has been growing a lot quicker than has owner-occupied. So going back a couple of years or, or so, 
uh, 6% or uh, starting with investment lending, it's been growing at a pace of around 11%. And compare that to owner-occupied, has been growing at a reasonably stable rate around the 6% the mark. So really that was one of the things that underpinned the regulator APRA deciding to impose an investor cap. Anthony touched on exactly how does that investor cap apply. And that's possibly one of the things from a lender's perspective that hasn't been as well understood in the market. So what APRA has effectively done is said, we will look at your investment book at a given period of time, and if that was $100 of investment lending in August 2014, that means that your investment book can't be more than 110 in August 2015. Right, so it's the movement in the book. So in effect what that means is that I've got $10 worth of growth that I can make over a one year period. It gets a little bit more difficult than that from a lender's perspective though. Because what they said, well, it's not just going to apply once. The balance as at August needs to apply a year later. And then September, your balance in September can only be 10% more October, November. So that is actually quite hard for us to deal with as a lender. Think about some of the different variables that are at play. I'm going to have runoff occurring on my book. And I don't know quite what rate that is going to occur at. All of you and we are writing applications. And as we know, an application doesn't settle on the day that you put it in. There's a three month uh, lag to get to settlement. So in terms of juggling that, to get to our 10% cap, you've got to work with what's the runoff rate going to be? What kind of applications do we want? How are they going to convert to get us to the cap? So I think the interesting thing on the back of that is that for us as lenders, the trick has been really how do we write the right amount of business, right? You want to write as much as you can, but APRA has been very, very firm that you cannot go above 10%. And in effect, if any of the banks were to go above 10%, uh, APRA has said that the penalty would be a very, very punitive uh, impost of additional capital, right? So no bank will want to go there at all. Right, so I run a sales team, as does uh, Steve Kane. Within that environment, and from the bank's perspective, our number one priority is actually to hit the investor cap, not to write too much investment lending. It has been that much of an imperative for us. But we've still got sales targets, and we still want to write as much business as we can. So what that has effectively mean, meant is that as a lender, we need to look at what kind of levers have we got available to restrict investment lending to the right level, but at the same time, we want to grow as much owner-occupied business as we possibly can. So, what are some of the kinds of different things that we've seen in relation to the investor cap? We've seen LVR caps, particularly here um, in, in Sydney, we've had one lender that imposed a cap on New South Wales alone. Uh, we've had most lenders restrict their LVRs by investment versus owner-occupier. We've had shading of rental income. And we've also had a repricing of investment books. And now, there is going to be some positive at the end of this. It's not that doomy and gloomy with uh, th thunder in the, the background, but it is sounding a little bit ominous. Um, we, we've even had one lender that, that pulled out of investment lending altogether. So I think the key thing to remember is that there will be ongoing changes within this because it is an absolute requirement that all banks need to meet uh, that investment cap. And while we've seen some price changes and we've seen other uh, changes occur, what we might see is a new equilibrium form. And then the banks will say, are we getting still too much possibly? And that might lead to another equilibrium and potentially another equilibrium after that. So I think we can expect to see more ongoing changes within the market going forward in relation to investment cap. So let's think about why is this not just something which has been imposed by the regulator, but why it might actually be a good thing for us as lenders to be thinking this way. If you think about the economic environment within Australia, it's actually been benign. Australia has not had a recession since Paul Keating was around, which was back in the early 90s. A recession is defined as two negative quarters of growth. Right? So it's actually been pretty good times for us. 
And as Anthony mentioned, we've got record low interest rates, but we've got high housing prices. At some stage, it is highly likely that we could suffer either some sort of economic correction, but it is also likely that interest rates will get back to their long-term average, which could be an increase of around 2%. 2 so think about what that might mean from your customer's perspective and possibly your own personal perspective as well. If you've got two properties, an owner-occupied property and an investment property, and there will be some borrowers out there that will actually feel a little bit of pressure if interest rates were to go up 2%, what are they most likely to do? In all likelihood, it will be the investment property that borrowers might choose to sell in the market to clear back a little bit of debt. And what that could mean is potentially a whole lot of investors heading for the exit at the same time, which would be pushing down property prices. So I think what we're seeing now is really an ordered and measured way to effectively cool that down, particularly in Sydney, which has had 35% growth um, in the last two years. So well done to all of you. Assume you, most of you own property, so you've done really well out of it. But I think this is really like taking a little bit of an immunisation rather than catching a disease. And it's a good thing uh, to, to give some protection going forward. The final thing that I'd like to touch on this part is also the difference between investor, owner, occupier uh, versus interest only and P&I. So I'll talk a little bit in a second about capital, uh, but there is also pressure as well that we believe as a, a lender that P&I is certainly more prudent. Right? So there are certainly advantages in having borrowers pay down their, their loans. And we think in particular there might be more pressure from the regulator in terms of differentiating and possibly restricting P&I, in particular in relation to owner-occupied. Right? It's not necessarily a bad thing uh, for borrowers to be building up the capital buffer uh, within their property. Let me now move to the capital requirement side of the equation. Anthony mentioned APRA's view, which is really effectively asking the banks to raise more capital. I wanted just to dive into that a little bit. There's an organisation which is called Basel that I'm sure you've all heard of it, but it is basically the group of bank regulators for the world, sort of like the MFAA of, of banking regulators. And what they've been working on over the last couple of years is what should banks do in a prudent way to have more capital so that they're more secure? And what APRA has done on the back of that is to think about its position. Right? But if you think about Australia, it's a little bit different from some other countries in that we've got a very concentrated banking sector. So here, the big four accounts for 80-odd percent of mortgage origination. And an interesting stat, 30% of the market capitalisation of the ASX is the big four banks. So because of that level of, of concentration, APRA has made the determination we want to be extra strong. And to do that, it's effectively said the big four banks in Australia need to be at the top quartile banks in the world. And it's used the terminology, we need the Australian banks to be unquestionably strong. So how have they been going about that? They haven't yet released a final determination, but it's expected sometime in 2016. And it is expected at that time that APRA will basically say that whatever the bank's level of capital was in 2012 will need to be 2% 2, 2 higher. So in most instances, that's going to mean going from 10% capital to 12, and that will be finalised sometime next year. On the back of that, you've seen all of the major banks raise significant amounts of capital as Anthony covered. So somewhere between three to 5.5 billion worth of capital within the market. All of that is actually a really good thing for all of us because like any business, banks need to make decisions between the reward to customers and pricing to customers and shareholders, but all of this underpins a strong, sound banking system. Right, with profitability and rewards uh, to shareholders. So I'd like to move on now to the balance sheet. 
And um, not widely, not all that widely known, but um, I'm actually a, a CPA, so I thought I'd wake up a bit of a balance sheet and do a, a little bit more of a walkthrough. But this is really Banking 101. Right, looking at the balance sheet first. On this side of the balance sheet, I've got my liabilities. And if you think about a bank balance sheet, there are really three components on the liability side of the equation. First of all, we've got wholesale fundraising from the capital markets. Secondly, deposits. And thirdly, equity, which sits at the bottom. So think about what happened at the, the GFC. Right? Capital markets dried up. There wasn't that much liquidity. Banks either couldn't raise wholesale capital markets, or if they could, it was expensive for them to do so. So what did that cause? It moved on to, effectively, a war on deposits. Right? All of the banks were looking to raise uh, deposits, and we saw very attractive rates being offered to depositors. On the back of both of those events, post-GFC, we saw mortgage rates or interest rates on mortgages rise, right? because the cost of funding had effectively become more expensive. So what we're seeing playing out now is similar to that, but this is on the equity component of the balance sheet, which we haven't really seen before. And I'll talk to that in a tick. So that's on the liability side. Let's have a look at the asset side. So as a bank, I've got a choice of the different kind of assets that I can invest in. On the one hand, it might be things like government bonds. I use them for liquidity management. Obviously, they're going to be really secure, low risk. On the other hand, I might choose to invest in commercial lending, banks to biz uh, loans to businesses, etc. By nature, that's going to be more risky. Or alternatively, I might choose to lend for mortgages. And Australia has one of the best histories of mortgages within the world. They're a very low risk uh, asset within the Australian context. So it's at this point that those two parts of the balance sheet come together from a regulator's perspective. Depending on the asset that I hold and the riskiness of that asset, APRA requires that you put aside some capital. So the less risky the asset, like mortgages, the less capital you need to set aside. And the way they do that is in relation to uh, capital weighting, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. So that covers the, our fundamentals on the balance sheet. Moving to the profit and loss. As a bank, we make margins through lending, right? but it's not the four and a half, five percent rate that we charge to customers. We've got to deduct the cost of funds. So out of that consumer rate, as a bank, we might earn a gross margin of, let's say in this illustration, uh, $1.20, so $1.20 for every $100 that are lent out. We've then got to pay expenses, uh, and that for this illustration is 40%. So we make a gross profit of 72. Good corporate citizens paying tax at 30% leaves a net profit after tax of about 50 basis points. So now let's put those two together. And before I talk about the numbers on the slide, this is probably the part of the presentation that will be sort of newest. As Anthony said, the 10% the investor cap is fairly well known. On the 20th of July, so only about a month ago, APRA announced some significant changes to capital weighting. And it is those changes that effectively led um, most of the banks in the market to put up their rates, which happened in the, the last number of weeks. So what was all that about? APRA determines the banks into two different categories. Most banks in Australia are called standard. The big four, plus Macquarie, are called IRB, which is internals ratings based, or it's sometimes known as advanced accreditation. So on the one hand, we've got the IRB banks over here, and we've got the standard banks over here. There's a really big difference between the two. On average, the standard banks have to put aside 35% capital, or have a risk weighting of 35% for every dollar of mortgages that they have. On the other hand, the IRB banks 
have highly, highly sophisticated ways to actually apply capital weighting at the individual loan level. To become IRB accredited costs literally millions and millions of dollars. It's very sophisticated, but if you go through the pain of getting accredited, APRA allows you to put a specific amount of capital per loan. And now back to the big change that happened on the 20th of July. APRA basically said to all of the IRB banks, the minimum that you can have in terms of risk weighting will go from 16% up to a minimum of 25. Right, so all of the big banks were effectively, uh, their capital relativity adjusted. So it was 16 to 35 for the standard, and that became 25 to 35 for the standard. And it is that factor that led to some of the, the repricing. So back to me as a bank. What's that going to mean for me in terms of returns to my shareholders or potentially the rates that I charge my customers? Well, as, as you can see on the chart there, if we walk through the, the one at the top first, if I've got an 18% risk weighting at a 10% uh, capital, so $1.80 worth of capital, and from the last slide on my P&L, I had 50 cents worth of net profit after tax, that gives me a return on equity available available to my shareholders of 28%. If I change my capital weighting up to 27%, with a minimum of 25, $2.70 worth of capital set aside, my same 50 uh, cents worth of net profit after tax, reduces my return on capital down to 19%. And it is that factor that has led to uh, the, the repricing. It was really all about capital, not so much about uh, the, the cost of funding on the, on the debt side. So are we at the end of that? Uh, there will be more changes to play out. APRA will be going through a process of defining what its final requirements are, but all of the banks within the market will have to keep a close eye um, on how that pans out. The final point that I wanted to, to make on this slide relates back to P&I versus interest only. So as an IRB bank, by nature, P&I loans are less risky than IO, so there is actually capital relief by having uh, P&I. And it is that factor uh, you will have seen that NAB actually chose to differentiate its price movements based on IO versus P&I whereas other lenders in the market chose to do it, uh, whether it was owner-occupied versus investor. So there may well be some more changes to play out within the mo uh, market more broadly along those lines. So that really covers off the capital side of the equation. And as I said, I think that's possibly the part that isn't as well known. Certainly the investor cap has had a lot of media attention, but it is actually the capital changes that have been more recent um, and that have had a pretty significant impact in the market. The final part that I'll touch on from a lender's perspective goes back to APG 223. And as Anthony said, that is the part where the regulator has been somewhat prescriptive. So here is the rule book that you need to follow as a lender and there are some pretty hard guidelines of changes that need to be followed. So what are some of the things that we've seen uh, on that front? loan affordability uh, to borrowers. So the kinds of things that different lenders have done on that side relate to LVR restrictions, uh, rental shading, overtime and bonus. So where the income's not so certain, uh, does that get shaded? There's also been a focus on living expenses. So trying to ensure that you've got, as a lender, you're making a decision based on actual living expenditure uh, rather than something like HEM, for instance. Anthony covered serviceability buffers. Um, finally, LVRs we've seen. It's quite possible that we might see different lenders changing LVR restrictions in different ways. So IO versus P&I, um, owner-occupied versus investor, it might come down to geographic changes. Right, so as a lender, I'm looking at what do I need to achieve what are the different tools that I've got available uh, to make changes? 
So in terms of for the future, I think the part that really hasn't been clear to a lot of us, and when we think about it, sometimes we think these changes have been going on forever. It's not forever. It's only been a couple of months. But possibly the part that hasn't been so clear in people's minds is that lenders are dealing with three challenges simultaneously. The investor cap, capital increases, and responsible lending. So that's seen different changes in relation to price, in relation to credit, owner-occupier versus investor differentiation, interest only versus P&I. We might see an environment where different lenders choose to change their product suites around in terms of what's available on market. I think it's fair to say that we will see ongoing changes uh, going forward within the market. So to summarise, a number of changes from a regulator perspective in response to the economic and the housing price uh, environment that we face. But as a lender, I'm actually okay with all of that. Right? Interest rates are likely to increase, so I want to make sure that as a lender I'm well positioned for that. So it's dealing uh, with investment lending, it's dealing with capital requirements, and it's also responsible lending. More changes possibly to come. But I would say with the changes within the environment that more and more customers are going to need guidance and advice. They're going to need someone to help to guide them through. And as brokers, you guys are really well positioned. So there's a lot of work in terms of keeping up to date with changes that are occurring, but then also helping to guide your customers through. So at that point, I'd like to hand over to Steve Kane, who will take it from the broker and customer perspective. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. This will be a frightening experience, but the, uh, thank you, Brett and Anthony. We've talked a lot about the regulatory environment. We've talked a lot about the lender perspective and the things that lenders are all looking at. And as Brett mentioned, this is all lenders. Well, it's certainly all ADIs, and those are the lenders that APRA regulates. It's very important that we understand that whilst there is massive change, it is certainly in my time in, in mortgages and certainly with the mortgage broking area, this is the most uh, intervention I've seen by regulators. It's certainly the regulators working together, which we've never really seen much of before. They understand that there is a desire to protect the economy from shocks that might occur around property prices, inflation, unemployment. So whilst there's many changes coming and it is a difficult situation around complexity, we support what they're doing because at the end of the day, everyone in this room wants to be in business in 10 years' time, wants to continue to grow your business, wants to continue to be successful as you are. On that front, I really do thank everyone in the room for being in the broking fraternity. And the reason I say that is, it's not about mortgages, it's about satisfying the financial needs of the Australian public in ever greater amounts. And that may well be for owner-occupied housing, it may well be for investment, Whatever their financial strategy is, the people in this room are providing the solutions for that and providing the solutions in ever increasing numbers. You've got a fantastic opportunity in front of you. With every cloud comes a silver lining and Brett talked a little bit about that. To, to look at really what we've seen in terms of the growth in the industry, we think that the mortgage broking channel market will continue to grow and we see it hitting around the 53% consistently in 2016, which means more than one in every two mortgage customers in Australia are seeking advice from yourselves. That's a fantastic position to be in. It's a growth story of enormous proportions. For those of us that have been around for a while, I remember back in the mid 90s uh, when uh, a broking really kicked off, uh, some of the commissions paid were $350 for a loan up front, no trailing commission, and it was really a transaction. What we see today are professional mortgage advisors like yourselves providing absolute financial solutions for customers in the marketplace and for the, the Australian public. So you've become an integral part of the financial services economy in the Australian context. It's really important to recognise that for the first time when APG 223 came out, it's the very first time I've seen in APRA guidelines mortgage broking mentioned. Mortgage broking has been around for many years, as we all know, but the regulator really saw the, their job as the purview of working with the banks. ASIC, of course, is policing 
responsible lending, NCCP, so they've been involved in the market a, a, a lot longer, but for the first time ever we saw APRA talk specifically about mortgage brokers. That's how important the function, the role you play in the, the Australian community is. It's just a fantastic position to be in, and really what we've got now is another level of complexity entering the market. We've got another level of change that's happening. Your customers aren't really interested in what Brett and Anthony have talked about. We all in this room need to understand it, and we need to be able to communicate that to our customers, but they're not really interested. They want to know what's going on, and more importantly, they want to know why it's going on. They would be wedded to the old paradigm of uh, housing loan interest rates don't change unless the official cash rate changes with the RBA. That was never the truth, but it's a myth that's been sort of promulgated for many years. We've seen that myth broken over the last few interest rate changes, but the reality is they need explanation as to why, and that's really the most important part of today. We're here really to talk with you and have a conversation about what you need to say to your customers. We needed to give you the absolute technical background from a regulator's perspective, the technical background, why the banks are doing what they're doing. They're not just waking up one morning and suddenly deciding to do this. The complexity that goes on in the back offices of the banks, and particularly the product areas, where all this financial modelling goes on and how do we restructure products and how do we get that to the market without trying to confuse the market too much. Well, all of that complexity and all of that change has meant that there has been a bit of a vacuum in terms of communication and that's what today's about. We hope you'll be leaving today to really understand, first and foremost, that we believe in the, in, in the mortgage broking fraternity, as do all of the banks. We recognise the service and what you, what you do for the Australian community and we recognise the value you contribute. To that end, it's also really important to understand that with every good, uh, with every good mass, massive change or, or, or dare I say crisis, there's always an opportunity for those people that are truly involved in a relationship with their customer to broaden their opportunity. We're seeing growth in equipment finance, small business and commercial lending happen in the broker channel as well. So what we're now seeing, and this, this is an information where it's through aggregation type uh, introduction, but there is many direct accreditations with brokers in this room across all of the banks. It's very important to recognise that you're in a unique position. We had NCCP come along a number of years ago and all that change and everyone thought it was just diabolical, we shouldn't be doing it, why do we need to do all that? Well, the fact that you've been doing a needs analysis, the fact that you've done a preliminary assessment and forwarded that to your customer, you have a wealth of information at your fingertips around the relationships you hold that you can now use in a very positive way to help your customers through these changes. It gives you a great opportunity to start talking in more depth to your customer. It really continues the change in the marketplace from transactional driven business to true relationship business. Usual disclaimer, if you're going to be giving advice of any type, make sure you have the requisite qualifications and licensing. But the reality is your customers are going to come to you with many questions. They'll be receiving notification from all the banks around changes that is happening in, to them and happening in their lives. They need to be informed what we're doing is making sure that we give you as much information as we can. We see this as the important role that we as a bank play to ensure that we give you as much support and as much information as we can so you can have a full and wholesome discussion with your customers. At the end of the day, our business in the third party channel and your business doesn't exist without customers and it's very important that we make sure they're fully informed. So you're going to get all these questions. It's really important that you have facts to deal with the questions that you are able to give to your customers the rationale and the reasons why. We know what we've got to do. You're getting a lot of stuff coming out of all of the lenders and banks saying this is what we need today. That's great, but you need to be able to explain why we're talking to your customer about it. So what we will be doing is providing you with a handy guide to talk to some of the changes, what's changed, banking regulations, uh, and how have the lenders responded. We're also going to give to you a letter that you can use, put on your own letterhead. We'll be sending this out by your various aggregators, but those people that have attended and registered to attend will also get this directly emailed to them. You can use it as you will. You can use it with your aggregators. If, you, if you're wanting to use it on your own letterhead, that's great too. It just gives a simple explanation to the customer as to what's gone on. We felt that, at the very least, that will trigger a great response for you to have another conversation. This is all about keeping your customers informed. It's all about making sure that they understand what's going on and it's making sure that you take the opportunity 
to strengthen your relationship, to provide services to your customer and to make sure that you are giving them the correct advice. As I said, responsible lending has enabled you to have a fantastic opportunity to revisit, as you should be, the future needs of your customers on a regular basis. This gives you a very, very good opportunity to talk about the massive change that are happening in the marketplace. So it's very important that you do that. It is important because as a person involved in the transaction, it just doesn't go to the bank or to the customer, it will come to you as well if you haven't adhered to the rules and regulations that have been already in place, uh, in particular around uh, foreign investment and, and investment to foreign nationals. So very important that we understand exactly what we can and can't do in the marketplace. Very important that the advice you give your customers is very good and is sound and based on facts. So uh, all of the banks are going to be providing information over time, but we, we thought it was incumbent on us to partner with the advisor, to run these sessions around Australia, to stimulate everyone, to get everyone to understand that there is significant change going through the marketplace. But you really are in the box seat to provide that advice. You have great tools at your fingertips, you have great support from your aggregators and your lender partners, and it's really over to you. This is not going to be one conversation either. I think that the reality is, as Brett and Anthony have said, we're likely to see more changes over time. So this is an iterative process and it should be very, very clear to yourself and your customers that your contact to them is going to be continuous over the next little while as we see markets adjust and as we see the regulators react to the measures they've put in place today. If those measures don't work, if we still see rapid increase of property prices and investment lending, particularly in the markets of Sydney and Melbourne, they are likely to do other things. We will always keep you informed about the impact of those other things, why they're doing them and how you need to communicate that to your customers. But this is a changed environment. This is not what it was six months ago. This is a very different environment and it's really important that as professionals, as advisors, as the trusted advisor to your customers that you make yourself fully au fait with what's going on and deliver that. And you know, it really is a, it's a great opportunity. So thank you once again for coming this morning. It has really been a, a great turnout. Uh, I think that you show the true professionalism that the broking fraternity have in relation to managing their customers, understanding risk and understanding the changes in the marketplace.